Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Andrew Morgenstein, and we're going to be speaking about the AOA and the NIH on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Before we get started, I just wanted to thank Oculus for their support of this episode. Uh, you want to make sure to check out their Myopia Master and the Pentacam for its incredible attributions to your myopia practice. Hey, thanks, Andy, for joining us. How are you today, my man? I'm doing great, Dave. Thanks for having me on this. It's, it's, a, it's a real honor to be here. It's awesome to get to speak with you. You've been involved in myopia management for a long time in a lot of ways. Uh, so a couple of years ago, the AOA was like, hey, we need to really get a, a, a finger on this myopia thing. How did that kind of come about? And mm -hmm. how did this evidence-based uh, myopia clinical report come about? It's a great question. So I've been for, for years now, um, and I can't talk about the evidence-based optometry committee at AOA without talking about Beth Nibe, who is my predecessor um, as the director of the committee. And so uh, Beth, I worked with in the past at TLC Laser Eye Centers, and she shifted over to AOA and to the Clinical Resources Group. And uh, Beth uh, brought me in uh, because of our work with TLC to help her out on the evidence-based clinical practice guidelines. She knew I had a background in writing papers and this and that kind of stuff. And I think the um, the process is, is quite tedious and she needed some help. And, and of course, if Beth asked, I said yes. Mm -hmm. She was a wonderful woman. Unfortunately, she passed away from cancer a couple of years back. And um, as a result, um, I was um, in the unfortunate position because of her death to uh, you know keep going with her work. And so I took over as the director of uh, these evidence-based clinical practice guidelines. And so one of the questions came up, you know, myopia management, as you know, Dave, because, you know, you're so heavily involved in it, um, it kind of came down the highway, um, you know, like a like a tractor trailer without brakes. And it was um, uh, it came on the scene. I know there was a lot of great research that was being done for decades, uh, but really in mainstream optometry, it really hit the ground running right around 2015 ish or so. And um, as a result, you know, we were doing our clinical practice guidelines and uh, the question came up from lots of optometrist members and the AOA is, you know, when is, when is uh, the, the evidence-based group going to do some work on this topic of myopia management? And so we sat down and we said, well, we need to get this information out quicker than a typical clinical practice guideline. So if you're uh, go on to the AOA website, you'll see that this is called a clinical report as opposed to a clinical practice guideline. The difference being is a clinical practice guideline takes about two years to really uh, develop. It's got a very, very strict process that we have to adhere to. Now, it's not to say that we didn't adhere to that process, but we wanted to get this document out quicker right. for the members and everybody else. And so we took uh, the bones of, an ex of a clinical practice guideline and we accelerated it um, to produce this document, which is purely evidence-based at the time that it was written. It was about two, two years ago. Um, and what we did is we sat down, we said, okay, let's get a bunch of, um, bunch of our committee members and a bunch of myopia management experts, bring them to the table, sit them down and say, hey, if we want to write an evidence-based guideline or a clinical report, what questions do we want this guideline to answer? So we developed this question list of things that we want to discuss. And then we went searching for the evidence through PubMed, Embase, Clinical Key, all the great resources. And so we came back with those papers. And then we took that, the papers that potentially could answer that question, we went through all of the evidence and found where the highest credible evidence-based journal articles had those answers to those questions. And, and we Andy, found our let, let so let me point out what some of those are, is what factors influence the development of myopia? How can myopia be classified? What are complications associated with the development of myopia? Risk factors for development of progressive myopia? Tests that need to be done for myopia? So these are like clinically relevant questions, right? This isn't just some abstract stuff. Like you, you as a group were like, what are the questions people ask? And, and you went out and found the answers. That's right. You know, it's, you know, AOA is, is a member-based organization. Any document that we make that's a clinical guideline or review, at the end of the day, we want to make it enhance your clinical practice come Monday morning. 
you know, if you're reading this thing over the weekend, we want to make a difference or or better your clinical practice just by giving you uh, the best quality clinical information that's out there. So you Andy, ask the clinical questions, you get the clinical answers. Besides, besides giving a resource to members, are, are there other reasons why this sort of information from the AOA is important in the realm of myopia management? I mean, this is the largest organization of eye care practitioners, right? right. So it's, it's probably, I, I would assume that there are benefits beyond just me as a clinician. Sure. You know, number one, and you know, at the end of the day, we all do this for our patients, right? So being able to and I know this is a, we've had this, we've actually lectured on this together. How do you talk to a parent? How do you give them the right information? And I think, so I think it's important on the one hand for doctors to be able to discuss this with patients because the, the large majority of these patients, to the best of my knowledge, are all minors, which means somebody has to make an informed consent decision on whether or not to proceed forward with this stuff. So being able to communicate all that great information to the person who's making the informed consent decisions for these minors, that's important. The other thing too, is that just like the AOA is an advocacy organization. And at some point in time, you've got, they have to bring this clinically relevant information in front of uh, legislators and lawmakers to let them know what's important in what you know, what's clinically important in the world and what we're seeing, uh, you know, Myopia, as we all know, impacts every job of every person that I know of. And, uh, you know, if, if you think about uh, uh, police officers, right? If you have a police academy that is accepting more police officers that are myopes, that makes a difference in the, in the type of police officer that you're putting on the streets because, you know, if their glasses or contacts fall off, that's a problem. Yeah. And so... Um, you know, we know the severity of myopia is getting worse. Therefore, you know, the minus two from 1980 is going to be the minus three from 2010 and potentially the minus four um, in 2030. And yeah. so these can, these social considerations obviously have to be made um, and they have to be told to everybody out there because it, it it's impacting our world. You know, in the myopia space, there's questions that people come up with is why doesn't the AOA, right? Fill in the blanks. There's so many right. like, why are we not fighting for legislation for things like this? Right? Well, yeah. these are the steps that need to be taken first, right? We've got to get clinicians on board and we all have to agree that this is the sort of thing. And so the AOA comes out with a report and it says, Hey, this is, this is how we see myopia. And then other steps are taken beyond that. Is that how it's happened with other things in the past? Yeah, I mean, the reality is, is that, um, uh, you know, speaking as a member myself, um, the AOA is is an organization that is trying to, um, number one, help patients, right? It's always patients first. Number two, very close second, is to support uh, doctors of optometry that are out there. Who are uh, helping patients, right? Yeah, who are helping patients, right? But we can't help patients if we don't have... Um, you know, a strong foundation and structure in, mm -hmm. in our profession, right? If we, if people take legislation away from us and what we can do to help our patients, then we can help our patients. And uh, example, obviously like in Florida, uh, you know, yeah. the success that they had with um, the title of doctor, even, you know, they uh, protected that uh, because patients would view us completely different if we were not allowed to call ourselves doctor. So um right. Yeah, no. The to get back to your question, the answer is is that the the organization does what is relevant to 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 help doctors do their job so they can help patients. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's really a critical step for us is that when we when we want to make advancements and bring people more in into awareness. We've got to do more than just the anecdotal clinical stuff that we've done in our offices. We have to have that evidence. So I think that this is a really good document for doctors anywhere or clinicians that do myopia management to be able to say, okay, that parent asked that question. And I don't, I, I know I've heard it in a lecture, but I don't know where to go to get the data. And you've asked all of those relevant questions. So I have to say, is there anything in that document? I mean, you've been in myopia forever, so I don't know that there's anything that surprised you, but there's is there anything in that document that you're like, hey, this is a gem. Like this is this is something that doctors 
really need to pay attention to this yeah um, and how to apply it and use it yeah I, you know i think that the um it's a really good question I, and you know i i love that you, you kind of keep me on my toes uh, and not give, not feeding me the questions prior to the talk is a really good question. And you know what? What's really the most important bits and nuggets of, of the document? I think it really is. Uh, number one is always awareness. I mean, if you look at the prevalence data that we put in there mm -hmm. on how how common it is in the country right now, and how much myopia itself is worsening, my personal belief is that it is uh, partly a function of the environment that we live in now. Right. So. And everybody's talked about this in all their lectures where, you know, we're sitting here on a computer talking into a camera, uh, but we're going to get off this, you know, go see a patient and then possibly uh, get on our cell phone. Right. And um, every Sunday, I know Apple puts out a thing. Oh, you're you're up five percent or down five percent in your weekly use of your phone. Those numbers are pretty high. And I think we you know, our worlds are shrinking. Um, as technology increases. So talking about the prevalence and the reasons why it's happening and some of the simple things that we can do uh, to break that cycle, get kids outside, get better lighting, that type of stuff. Obviously we can get into all of the other mechanisms of treatment, but um, I think, you know, talking about the basics with parents is really the most important thing in understanding it. Number two yeah. is um, testing and getting accurate data um, and monitoring accurate data to, to watch progression of yeah. these patients. Yeah, one one of the data points that you know just was in here that I think that we continue to need to uh, hone in on is that myopia isn't a prescription disease; it's an axial length disease, and it's a um, a stretching of the eyeball. But one of the data points in here was that clinic that children with refractive error of plus fifty or less at seven or eight, or plus a quarter or less at nine or ten, are at a significant risk of developing myopia. That's a statistic from that you guys, you know, helped bring to the light that myopia isn't just that negative number. It's that there's risk factors and we need to be focusing in on those as well. You also did a great job of talking about the treatments and I, I can't, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up some more recent news that uh, the NIH is bringing about uh, with regards to atropine. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're in the DC area, you like these people are your next door neighbors. So just recently, literally, <laughs> <laughs> I would say that tongue in cheek, but one of my, uh, ironically, one of my daughter's uh, close friends, um, her father works um, not an NIH, but on the uh, uh, one of the device panels for FDA. And yeah. we, of course, don't talk about work, so we can keep our lives uh, completely separate and and clean. Yeah. Um, but uh, well, you know, swimming pool atropine. and all that stuff. Tell us about what, what just came yeah. out with NIH and atropine. So, you know, there's been great studies. And let me just say, there's been great studies over the years with atropine that we've learned. NIH just came out with a report um, very recently, within the last week or so, um, that they said, uh, according to this study, and I'm paraphrasing, 0.01% atropine um, as compared to controls, um, there was no difference in my myopia progression, but specifically the 0.01% concentration, uh, which is to say that higher concentrations of atropine um, are required. And that was, uh, it was an NIH report. I believe it was part of the PEDICS uh, group uh, that came out with it. And um, I don't have the exact study in front of me right now, but that was the um, the the bottom line was that uh, there was a negligible difference in myopia control with 0.01 atropine as compared to uh, controls. So you big know, big news, obviously, and it, that that uh, um, kind of goes against some of the other studies. Now you have to look at being an evidence based optometry guy. That's the big headline. But when you get down to the nitty gritty, how big was the population that was studied? What was the age group of the population? Was there an ethnic, um, you know, uh, population that was looked at or not looked at? Um, so th there's a lot of questions that you have to ask when you read stuff like that. So, OK, so I just have to pound hone on this a little bit because th this is this is contradictory to other studies. Correct. That we have seen, for example, combination treatment, orthokeratology plus zero point. 0.1% right. shows that our, our patients progress less when in the combination than with atropine alone. 
there's other studies like the lamp and the atom study that seem like there is a difference in control. So how in the world can a government body come out and just say flatline? Yeah, all of that is not true. According to our study, that is not the case. Right. So, you know, what I think, again, what I think you have to remember is that NIH is not saying don't use 0.01% atropine. Um, and again, I don't have the luxury of having the study in front of me right, right. now, yep. but they're saying in this population that we looked at, these were the results that we got. Um, it just happened to come out from a big organization, a pretty big organization mm -hmm. that the has a pretty, pretty hefty title behind their name. So um, again, I think, you know, when we're reviewing evidence-based when we're reviewing papers to help write an evidence-based product, um, the abstract is not where the meat and potatoes are, right? It's in the methods and the discussion and the limitations of the study. And I think that's really um, what we need to probably do with this to really understand where these results came from, mm -hmm. right? If you, I mean, if you took a hundred people that uh, nobody had lung cancer and all hundred people smoked for 15 years, you can conclude that smoking does not cause lung cancer um, in that population. But, you know, if you looked at 100,000 people, that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I'm yeah. not trying to discount the results that they got from the study, nope. but I would just probably mm -hmm. want to get more nitty gritty and detailed um, into the population and who they looked at and why. Yeah. The headline is never the article, right? And this is, you know, somewhat concerning for us is because in the paths to approval, there are medications that are looking to get approval for the treatment of myopia management. That's and right. from what I'm seeing so far, most of these are 0.01%. And so, you know, are we going to see an FDA battle now because of this study saying, well, your, your data is, con you know, is conflicting with other data that is out there? And I guess that becomes a concern for the sake of patients, because many of us have people on this per concentration of atropine and, and, you know, perceivably clinically it's working. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it, it's interesting information, but you know, the, what I do think is important is, okay, so we have this, this information from this study and this, this study group, the PD study group that came out. Uh, but again, what is, Point zero zero point zero two percent say. What does zero point zero five percent say? What do yeah. orthokeratology lenses say? What do um, you know the the select uh, multifocal or um, uh, I, I forget the term that uh, the manufacturers are using for their um, lenses? Right. Um, you know what about that? That's not to say that there's no treatment out there. That's to say that this study came up with these results yeah. on this concentration of this drug. I guess, you know, and, and, and again, needing to dig into that study and not having it in front of either one of us. Um, we also have some studies that have come out recently with regards to the sourcing of the atropine. Mm -hmm. And in, we may source, you and I may source our whatever percentage atropine from two or three or four different places. And we're coming up with an understanding of they're not all the same, right? They may not be as effective or as high of a concentration as uh, as as we really expected it to be. So this is an interesting headline for us that we need to kind of dig into and figure out where this sits with us clinically and continue to look at the other evidence-based things that are out there to help us make those decisions. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you this, and this is what I think is, um, what I think we all could probably, even me, and I've been doing this for you know quite some time, is um, really learn to, I think we could all, we all can improve on learning to read studies better, mm -hmm. right? To be better critical readers of evidence-based journal articles um, and ask the questions and, you know, um, you know, really learn how to, uh, I, I mean, we all can read abstracts. We all read papers and stuff like that, um, but really uh, learn to dissect um, clinical information so you can better understand the results that are coming out of it. Because yeah. most clinical studies have a pretty narrow lane that they look at. You know, they, they, uh, when a clinical study is formulated, um, you know, you know, your age, generally speaking, your age population that you want to look at, 
Um, you know, you're uh, in some cases, depends what country you're in, what racial group you're going to be looking at, you know, um, and you know, are these sick people? Or are they not sick people? Are we doing uh, a prospective observational study or are we comparing two groups together, uh, placebo versus some people that are treated? So there's a, it's a pretty narrow lane yeah. mostly that you're looking at. And um, unless you're looking at a big study, a big trial, uh, randomized controlled trial uh, type of stuff uh, to make big decisions on big populations of people. Yeah. And so I, I just think that, and, and again, I can always do better. I think everybody could always do better of learning yeah. to read critically and understand the information that you were teasing out of the article. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you being on the podcast, uh, your insights into things happening in DC and how we can fit that into our clinical experience is always appreciated. Anytime I talk with you, I learned so much. Thanks for, thanks for yeah, my pleasure. Me. Yeah. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe. Special thank you to Oculus for their support of this podcast. Make sure to check out the Myopia Master and the Pendicam for their incredible axial length measurements. Thanks. And we'll see you next time. One, two, three, thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.